All right, so we are on viruses. We're at part two. So just a really quick review. Make sure you guys are able to understand these objectives. So if I were you, I would write them down and make sure that I'm able to answer those questions as we go through the notes. Your vocabulary, make sure you write each of the words down, virus, capsid, lytic infection, bacteriophage, lysogenic infection, prophage, and retrovirus. Make sure that you can, that you have those readily available and you write them down in your notes. So we kind of went through a history of some of the people that were discovering things about viruses. And if you missed that, make sure you listen to the part one of this. We went over some of the different structures. We went over a few of the different kinds that you should have seen in your homework. And now we're here. All right, so this is where we stopped off, just saying that a virus or virus reproduction and that a virus is non-living. That means that it cannot procreate or reproduce on its own. It needs something to do that. And I'll go ahead and repeat what I was saying before about the American biochemist Wendell Stanley. He was able to actually isolate crystals of a virus. And because living organisms don't crystallize anything, he was able to pretty much say, you know what, viruses, they, they definitely are not alive because living things don't crystallize. And we still use his conclusion today. So kudos, thank you, Wendell Stanley, for that amazing discovery. And let's review the definition. A virus is a non-living particle made of proteins, nucleic acids, and sometimes lipids. And again, how do they reproduce? We just said that they can only reproduce by infecting living cells. All right, let's move on. So virus infections. When we talk about virus infections, a virus is similar to a computer virus. So let's kind of use the analogy of an actual virus infecting its host and a computer virus infecting your computer. So let's kind of go through how these two quote unquote virus infections are similar and kind of how they're different. So if we're looking here and we're talking about a computer virus, let's say that you get a message with an infected attachment. Everyone has seen how you get a or heard of messages to where it's like, hey, make sure you send this to 10 people or send it to 20 people or you won't have good luck for 10 years. A lot of the time, those messages are actually infected with a virus or a computer virus. It's sent over and it's hidden. It seems like an innocent appearing email when it arrives and when it's opened. It might even have a great message to go along with it that you really enjoy. However, a computer virus escapes from the attachment and actually infects the computer's internal code. So when we think of humans or we think of living things that would be able to be used as a host, we have an internal code or a, here we go, genetic code that you guys learned about. And let's talk about how that would be able to be affected. So we have viral DNA or RNA. A biological virus presents a desirable protein on its surface. That means something that the body or something that the cell actually needs or wants, uses, it's going to go ahead and say, you know what? I have a receptor protein for that. I'm going to receive it in my receptor protein. It attaches on the recept attaches to the receptor on the cell surface. So it's going to go ahead and fit in there like a lock and key. And I told you guys last semester, we talked about lock and key and how a protein will actually have a space for it to fit perfectly in there. That's why it's desirable on the outside of the virus, because the protein receptors look at it as, hey, this is something I need. Now, once that, once that um, 
receptor, it attaches to the receptor, the virus enters the cell and it releases its DNA or its RNA, pretty much its genetic code, which may replicate or integrate into the host cell's DNA. When we say replicate, it can enter depending on what kind it is and then just start immediately replicating and making new ones. But it can also actually integrate and become a part of your DNA and actually change your DNA and keep replicating every single time you get a new strand of DNA or every time you get a new two strands of DNA or RNA, it's going to replicate with it. So it's the same thing, virus infects a computer, virus infects the host cell. Interesting, right? If you have any questions or don't understand this, please give me a call, please text. You can send a text message. If you don't have the Remind app, it can't download apps. You can literally text message the number that I sent out. All right, let's go to the next slide. Okay, so here we have viral infections. So my question is, what happens after a virus infects a cell? You have that it goes inside living things. We just said viruses can't replicate or reproduce on their own. They have to go inside living things. The viruses use the genetic information to reproduce. So let's talk about how the viruses use their genetic information to reproduce or make more of themselves inside of living cells. Some viruses replicate immediately. When you have viruses that replicate immediately, we call these lytic infections. Other viruses initially persist or carry on in an inactive state within the host cell. When I say that, when they first get in there and they get inside of the cell, they may actually not activate, so you might not even see it. You might not have the symptoms. This is called a lysogenic infection. Again, so if we have a lytic infection, the virus replicates immediately. If we have a lysogenic infection, the virus will initially persist in an inactive state with inside the host cell. All right, let's go to lytic infections. So with a lytic infection, a virus enters a bacterial cell. And we remember that bacterial cells or bacteria are prokaryotes. They do not actually have a nucleus. This is kind of just reiterating and going through some of the things that we learned and bringing it back so that we understand kind of a basis of what we're learning. So a virus enters a bacterial cell. It makes copies of itself and then causes the cell to burst or lies. So let's kind of go through the typical steps of a lytic infection. Some people will pronounce it lytic and some will say lytic infection. So first step, the virus injects DNA into a bacterium. Here we have the DNA core inside the protein capsid is going to bind or connect to the surface or the outside of a host cell. The virus injects its DNA into the cell, meaning it puts the DNA inside the cell, and the cell then begins to make messenger RNA, and we know that as mRNA, from the viral genes. That is our first step. And if you just thought to yourself the way I did, okay, mRNA is messenger, what are the other two kinds of RNA? Just as a reminder, you have mRNA, you have rRNA, which is ribosomal, and then you have tRNA, which is transfer. So first step, virus injects 
DNA into a bacterium. Second step, the viral genes are transcribed by the host. So the viral mRNA or messenger RNA is going to be translated into viral proteins that act as a molecular wrecking crew. They are going to be chopping up that cell's DNA, okay? In this stage, this is what we're calling it. This second step, you can kind of think of it as, it's the chop shop. Cars get chopped up, DNA is getting chopped up. All right, third step. The bacterium makes new viral proteins and nucleic acids. So under the control of viral genes, the host cell now is going to make thousands of copies of viral nucleic acid and capsid proteins. This is going to enable or help the virus to reproduce. Next part. The proteins and nucleic acids assemble into new viruses. Oh my God. They're in there. That genetic code is in there and now they're able to reproduce. Look at that. Now, in this step, the viral DNA is assembled into new virus particles. Now they become just like the one that infected the DNA, that it, or that infected the bacterium. So see how this virus is right here? And it's kind of coming undone, injecting the DNA or the genetic code inside. And now look here, see how this looks just like that? It's replicating them, and now there's a whole bunch of new ones. And if we go to the next step, which is your final step in your lytic infection cycle, the viral enzymes lies the bacterium. It's going to burst through the cell wall. The new viruses escape. Oh my gosh, right? So before long, the infected cell lyses it will release hundreds of virus particles that may go on to infect other cells in your body. So in a lytic infection, how does the virus make copies of itself? If we look here, it's showing us. It is going to insert its genetic, it's gonna attach to the bacterium, and it's going to, the DNA is right here in this capsid, in the head part. It's going to push straight through and insert itself into the bacterium, which directs the cell to make and assemble new viral parts. Now, why can a lytic virus remain in a particular host cell for only a limited time? That means, how come it can stay in there only for a short amount of time? simply because a lytic virus, its job is to destroy. It eventually destroys the host cell by causing it to burst. All right, let's see where we are now. We're gonna have to stop here because we're gonna move on to lysogenic infections.